now um, going to have another session about um, packaging. Um, this time um, with John Wood. John, are you there? I am, and if I remember to unmute myself, that'd be a good start, wouldn't it? Hey, fantastic. Uh, over to you, John. Uh, thank you very much, Chris. Um, so my name is John. You can see that on the screen. You don't need to know more than that. For me, the thing about plastic packaging is uh, I, 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 have, I have quite a love affair with plastic packaging. I'm going to be upfront about that. Um, but for me, the thing about plastic packaging is not just the materials that it's made of. I will touch on that. But for me, all packaging is the excuse to write something on it. Now, for me, that's, that's the, the crucial part of it. Uh, and if you've got a, your recycle bin now and you just put your hand in and you pull something out and you look at it, I guarantee you can follow the trail of breadcrumbs that an engineer has left that will help you sort of see where they have breathed on it. And I don't mean literally breathed on it. I mean, that, that you know, in the land of COVID, um, breathing on stuff isn't a good idea. But certainly we have... I won't even say interfered with your food because I was always told not to play with my food. But in this case, an engineer at some point has actually graced its presence upon your food. So I, I've just had a route through the bin and, and I've come across, for instance, first thing we have uh, milk. It is what it is. It's just milk. Now, I grew up being one of those kids who wouldn't just sit down for breakfast and eat their breakfast. I needed to be entertained while I was having that breakfast. So for me, I sort of wanted to sit and read the box. And it was great. So I fell in love with this idea of reading the stuff on the box, the small print, the, uh, the details there. And that's where I started to discover that there was a lot of curiosity that was scratched. And uh, that itch was scratched very much when I started to read the things that were written in the small print. So starting with the milk, very, very simple. It tells us there it's pasteurized, skimmed milk. Nothing exciting there. Normally, it might say pasteurized, standardized, homogenized, skimmed milk, semi-skimmed milk. It will actually tell us the processes that an engineer has gone through in order to get that product to you. Now, we don't normally stop and go, what do you mean standardized? What do you mean homogenized? Homogenized is a really interesting phrase. You don't see it on this because this is skimmed milk and skimmed milk hasn't been homogenized. Sorry, they had skimmed milk here. I didn't have uh, semi-skimmed. But if you look at semi-skimmed, you just go to your recycle bin now and have a look. It'll say homogenized. Now for me that's really interesting because that's a step that is a clue to the engineering. So the story of milk is when milk arrives in a dairy once it's been looked at and examined and treated and then it needs to go through a process. Ah, you've got it there. Do you have it, Chris? you have there you go pasteurized homogenized get semi skimmed milk brilliant that's perfect that's what i wanted to see uh, and that's semi skimmed milk so the first thing that they do when they put the milk in um they spin it in like a, a centrifuge and that separates what is effectively skimmed milk that's just the the liquid stuff from what we would say are the fat deposits there's a density between the two. Oil and water don't mix, so there's a density difference. So oil will float on top of water because, because it's less dense. So those less dense things get separated. And the first thing that they do is take out all of the fat and make this. When they come to make Chris's milk, they then go in to do the next stage. And the next stage is to put some of that fat back in. Now, obviously, they can't just put lumps of fat back in. What they have to do is homogenize it, homogenesis, home making one, again, or one making. What they do is they force that fat through tiny microscopic little jets, and forcing it through the jets gets droplets of just the right size. Now, when I was a kid, we used to get glass bottles. Anybody get a glass bottle from the, from the milkman? And, and if you were lucky, you'd be first to open the little foil on the top, and you could open it, and you'd pour it out and there'd be a big blob of fat that would end up on your cornflakes. For me, that was joy. It's lucky, well, we're lucky I can get in this shirt. 
But when that happens, uh, that's because the droplets of fat were quite large. And because of that, they would separate in the milk. Nowadays, we don't, because we homogenize it. We force that extra fat through the microscopic little jets, which give us just the droplet size that we want. So that word homogenizing actually tells us a lot about what's happened in the process of making our milk. We put the fat back in, but to get the droplet size just right so that it doesn't separate, we homogenize it through that process. And of there, of course, pasteurized. It's either pasteurized or, you know, pasteurized or sterilized. I grew up in the Midlands, so it was pass or sterile. That was the, always the question. But um, yes, st pasteurized milk. That, that for me was, was, was a revelation. Being able to look on the side of a packet of food and go, ah, ah, I, 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 see, I see what you've done to this. But the more you look at other things, the more you can discover about them. Um, it's, I, I got this from the last Tory party. Um, <clears throat> no, I didn't actually. I just, I, I don't know why, but I've just found this in the bin, bizarrely, the recycling bin. Somebody at the university is having quite an engaging uh, meeting. Um, what always has surprised me about this, and I'd be surprised if Chris has got one of these in his bottle. I'm going to try and find where it says what I know it's going to say. There it is. Contains sulfites. Okay. Contains sulfites. Why do they tell us that it contains sulfites? I mean, you, you're really hard pushed to get a bottle of wine that doesn't contain sulfites. For me, sulfites is just one of those things. There's a lot of myths about it, but effectively it's a preservative. Now, the, the more you sort of scratch away at that itch and go, Ooh, so, so why do we use it? And this for me is what packaging on food is about. It pushes that button to make you go, what? Why is that? Contains sulfites, so it does. So actually, it um, would be hard pushed to, to get wine that lasted longer than six months, kept in perfect conditions, if we did not add that preservative. And yeah, there's a lot of myths about it and, and, and things like that. People say, well, it gives, you, it gives you headaches, or red wine gives you more headaches. Actually, the amount of sulfites that you are legally allowed to put in a bottle of wine uh, is less, it's lower for red wines than it is for sweet wines. So if you, you know, if you, if you really don't like the idea of having sulfites in your wine, drink a red wine or a US organic one. Because uh, in the US, uh, you're not allowed to add sulfites to your wine if you call it organic wine. Um, the rest of the world gets around this by saying, well, it's made with organic grapes, so it can still have sulfites in it. At the end of the day, this is a, it's a chemical engineering thing. This is the world you want. The world that you want is of convenience. I want to be able to pop down to Londis or the co-op and buy myself wine uh, and, and, you know, well, try to make it last longer than 24 hours. Um, so for me, the stuff that is on food packaging is the, the most important stuff. And it's the stuff that nobody really notices. Um, for instance, lemons. Lemons, bag of lemons. My bag of lemons, you think, well, well, the food packaging there is, is it's just a net. Yeah, but it has a label. Look at the label to have a clue as to what's actually happened. So a, a bag of waxed lemons will tell you that it contains two particular e-numbers. Now those e-numbers, you think, well, what are they? Whether well, they're waxes. And it sort of makes me go, okay, what sort of waxes? I mean, I know why you'd wax a lemon. You wax a lemon because, well, for me, I like things that are shiny. And certainly adding that wax makes it shiny. It looks fresher. And when I buy lemons, I am going to look at the lemon and go, yeah, that looks manky, or that one really looks nice. But when it comes down to the actual lemon, the lemon that looks freshest is the one that's been waxed. And the reason it looks freshest is because it is the freshest one. It's the one that has been waxed, and waxing it actually prevents it from being, you know, well, spoiled in transit. That's kind of important. But the more you ask, okay, what are these e-numbers? What are these waxes? Well, one of them is made of crushed beetles, which is fine if you're, you know, sort of not a vegetarian, or, and you're the sort of person that eats the rind off the lemon. Well, some people do. But that clue there should tell you Actually, what I should do is just just rinse the lemon in warm water if I'm going to use the rind and I'm going to 
you know, substitute my lemongrass by using lemon rind in my Thai curry. Wash it. That's why the labelling on your packet says wash before eating. And then said, I found a really interesting thing once on a, on a packaging material. I said, why would you want to wash your Sainsbury's organic taste the difference magical apples, your pink lady apples? Why would it say wash before use if these were organic? Surely you can picture the idea that they've been picked by virgins and blessed by popes and things like that. But actually, in reality, what's happened here is that they've been processed. Yes, you'll taste the difference organic pink lady apples in some way have been processed. And the labels are merely a way of being able to tell you that. They don't need to tell you what they have processed it with because it's only processed in order to transport it without spoilage. And this is the interesting thing, because you then start to ask the questions, spurred on by what you've read on the packaging, to say, well, why? Why is it a processed food? How is it processed? Take you through the story of an apple. When an apple falls from a tree, it has one sole purpose in life, and that's to make baby apple trees. I know, it's the selfish gene in every way. I'm not going to quote Richard Dawkins for the rest of my life, though. It falls from the tree, and its seeds are right in the centre. So it needs to release those seeds. So it needs to decay. Now, when it comes to decaying fruit, we're all familiar with the fact that enzymes are responsible for making fruit bruise and, and go brown. If you cut an apple in half, then you get that sort of enzymic browning happening. In, in an apple, the vast majority of those enzymes are actually right next to the skin, or actually in the skin. The reason being is because when an apple falls, the skin bruises and that triggers the train re chain reaction that enables the fruit to decompose and to come apart. And this sounds sort of sensible then because that releases the seeds and it grows a little baby apple tree given the chance and the tree lives to fight another day. That's great. So how do we slow that down? How do we make sure that I can move apples safely from the tree without dropping them, package them, crate them up and move them along and get them to some other place where the supermarket is able to put them on the shelves, sell them to you, you take them home, put them in a bowl and watch them rot there. But for me, that's the element of where the packaging comes in. Because what they will do with an apple is they will spray it with citric acid. You can't heat up an apple before you sell it you can't cool it down because ice crystals will form and that will change the whole uh, pro, you know, nature of the apple. You can't heat it up, that would destroy the apple again. So what they do is they spray the outside of the apple, where all the enzymes are, with citric acid. Yeah, just like lemon juice. That changes the pH of the skin of the apple, which means when the apple is dried and then packaged, it can be safely bought by you and that because you're not handling physically the apple, you're picking up a bag of apples, that coating stays there, which means that that fruit stays fresher for longer. And for me, this is the important part of food packaging. Sometimes we look at packaging and we kind of go, well, I know, I know, I know just, it's convenience. No, sometimes you really, really have to trust an engineer and to know what they're doing and go, there's a reason why it comes in a bag. And that's so that you don't, knock off or wipe off that enzymic inhibitor on your apple, that citric acid. So there's a case for plastics. I'm, and I'm having listened to the, to the, the last speakers, there are many different ways in which we can do that. And there are very novel ways of looking at plastics. But for me, we just got plastic is plastic. I live in a house I've inherited two, two, two stepchildren this year, and neither of them know how to recycle, which I find, frankly, horrific. They're 19 and 21, and they don't know what they need to do to recycle. So I gave them a packet of meat, and they'll put the packet of meat, they'll eat, they'll eat the meat, and they'll chuck the whole thing straight in the bin. The concept of, I just need to rinse it and put it in the recycling bin, 
is an alien concept to them. We are failing a generation because they do not know what to do with their plastic waste. For me, plastic is an astounding material, a precious material. We should actually be really focusing carefully and clearly where we do need to use plastic materials. That's the controversial part, is that we're up against a lot of other voices that say all plastic is bad. No, plastic is brilliant. If we didn't have plastic materials, this packet of meat, it would be rubbish. You probably wouldn't buy it. The supermarkets probably wouldn't be able to sell it because by the time you bought it, it would look horrible. And the reason being, they say, well, you can buy meat in the butchers and it looks good. Yeah, it does. In this case, the clue to where the engineer has blessed your food um, is written in very, very small print on the back. There it is. Okay, it says, packaged in a protective atmosphere. What sort of atmosphere? Mm. Some people say, well, is it a vacuum? Well, well, no, clearly, it's not a vacuum. What it actually is, in this case, and I can't prove this to you now because I've actually just done a Christmas lecture where I've just done this experiment. Um, I've opened it up. In this packet, which was sealed, and it's the only way you can seal a protective atmosphere in, this was full of oxygen. And the reason being is because it's meat. Surely the animal has died. But the cells that make up the tissues that make up this particular product are very much alive. They're not receiving a fresh blood supply. But if we give them oxygen, they will stay fresher for longer. When you walk into a supermarket and you look at your meat, are you going to go with the one that's red and fresh? Or are you going to go with the one that's brown and decaying? You're clearly going to go with the one that looks fresh. Without the oxygen, this meat would deteriorate so much more quickly. And it's not just meats. Pre-packed salads. Pre-packed salad comes in a tub, plastic tub with a film on top. Packaged in a protective atmosphere. What sort of an atmosphere? Again, think about the product inside. This time, do we want to give it extra oxygen? I don't know, is that the food that plants want? Plants want carbon dioxide. So what we do is we take our packet of pre-packed salad and we'll give it a hundred times more carbon dioxide than is naturally available to us in the air. We'll give it 5% carbon dioxide. 5% carbon dioxide. It's, again, it's the, the plant is not a plant anymore. We've got a collection of leaves, but those leaves are very much still undergoing that aspect of photosynthesis. They're still taking in light and converting it into sugars. They're becoming sweeter as they go along. They will last for longer if we give them the food that they last for longer. So giving them carbon dioxide, 5%, not only encourages the, um, the plants to stay alive for that little bit longer rather than deteriorating, but secondly, 5% carbon dioxide is it's quite toxic. Put you in a room and flooded it with 5% carbon dioxide, it wouldn't be long before you collapsed and, and passed out. Long term, it would be even worse for you. You would probably die. And this is really interesting because when you think about what other things don't like 5% carbon dioxide, it's an awful lot of microorganisms. Anything that wants to hitch a ride on your salad, microorganisms, uh, bacteria, things like bacteria and stuff like that. They don't like, most of them don't like 5% carbon dioxide. Some of them do. Um, but I spent 10 years as a medical microbiologist growing things, growing bacteria in different environments. Most of the kind of things that you're going to grow naturally in on plants, in lettuces for instance, because lettuce forms quite a lot, doesn't it, of our pre-packed salads. Lettuces, they're used to a small amount of carbon dioxide, they're used to 20% oxygen. Well, so the bacteria that grow on them, give them 5% carbon dioxide, the plants go, oh, great, but the bacteria that live on them, not so much. What about all the creepy crawlies? They also don't like 5% carbon dioxide. So actually, using pre-packed materials, using plastic packaging, rather, we can really make a difference to to the quality of our food. And the higher the quality of our food, the more nutrition we get from it.
which means that the less food that we actually need to eat to be able to get the same amount of nutrients. And for me, this is one of the most important parts, is that just by looking at the packaging, we might form a very, very quick opinion and go, oh, plastic is bad, let's get rid of all plastic. But it's not necessarily the case. For me, the most important thing here is, what do we do with our waste? Plastic is precious. We do need to use it very, very carefully. And we need to use it where it makes the biggest impact. And for me, our food packaging, it might not be the most obvious thing that we need to keep, but arguing for plastics in our food packaging is really important. But aside from that, as I say, it's the things that are written on it that make all the difference. Whether that's glass, whether that's plastic, whether it's the paper label that sticks on it. We need to be more curious about it. And for me, I'm just delighted that that was one of those things that I learned uh, to do when I was very, very young. Digestive biscuits. Pick up a packet of digestive biscuits and just read the ingredients. As you read those ingredients, at some point, you're going to go, what, 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 what's that? What, what am I reading? What, what, what is partially inverted sugar syrup? Does that mean they've taken sort of a bowl of, bowl of sugar and just gone up, almost turned it upside down? What does partially inverted sugar syrup mean? But the trick is to not stop there. The trick is to go and follow that trail of breadcrumbs to see why we use partially inverted sugar syrup. Whatever it is. I know what it is. You find out for yourself why we use it in our products. So for me, I have kind of a love affair with, with, with packaging. For me, it's been one of those long journeys that's taken me all the way from sitting there reading the cornflakes and going, what do you mean fortified with vitamins and iron? What sort of iron? What do you mean edible iron? Edible iron? No, there's only one iron in the periodic table. What do you mean iron? Well, how do they put that iron in there? How big is it? How do they stop it rusting? What happens to it when it gets into my stomach? Which is the most effective way to be able to get that iron into me? And then before you know it, you're an engineer and it's too late for you. Welcome to the world of science and engineering. If these kind of questions push your button, then, then that's a good thing. Read your packaging material and when you finish with it, follow the instructions and recycle them properly because that's going to make a difference. Not only are we actually going to be alive and fit eating our healthier food, but we're going to save the world from actually having to throw away a lot of that food if we do not keep using the proper materials for the right job. Thank you. Thanks very much, John. That was fantastic and fascinating. And um, yeah, I'm certainly with you with the reading packaging. Um, I remember as a boy just reading um, the packaging of um, cereal boxes and stuff. Yeah, it's true, isn't it? I know. What do you mean fortified with vitamins and iron? And you go, well, why would you put iron in it? What do you mean? We put spanners in my food. Um, and then you realise that you're actually a, a beautifully constructed bag of chemicals. You know, you're a carbon-based life form. You, you, you're probably at my age, you're about half of me is H2O. Um, you know, I'm, I've got calcium as bones, otherwise I'd just be a blob on the floor. Uh, there's enough iron in me to make two small nails. And before you realise it, You've, you've picked the scab off being curious uh, and, and, and I'm sure that Matt Pritchard is sort of, sort, of, sort of having a little twitch every time I use the word curious right now because uh, it's, it's one, of his, uh, one of his things along with wonder. Uh, but yeah, yeah reading, reading packages. I, I, I've just done a, a Christmas lecture to 450 kids and I've, I've gone through a Christmas dinner and helped them realise just where the clues have been left by engineers on all the food that they're going to be eating over Christmas. Everything from their roast potatoes all the way through to their Christmas pudding, their pigs in blankets, why they contain bamboo fibre and all that thing. And they're questions that they would never ask. But now I'm hoping that they're all going to go away and be a little bit more forensic in looking at their food. And as they read the packaging, I'm hoping that they also learn how to recycle it properly. I don't know why we don't put the recycling guidance on there. The little symbol that just says, you know, the three arrows just means nothing. 
they put it on yogurt pots and we know that yogurt pots mostly are made of polystyrene i mean that they're not recyclable we can't recycle those kind of things we're in the process of moving towards you know, a different kind of plastics but that requires companies to retool everything in their in their process of, of manufacturing that product so yogurt pots for me they're, they're about as evil as a pringles tube at the moment which you can't recycle at all because it's foil wrapped cardboard with a metal lid and a plastic topper mm. how annoying so they're, they're quite good for lighting up the torch in there and reflecting all the light inside so they are they are make your, own, make your own kaleidoscope with a pringles tube you might as well because you can't recycle it yeah you don't throw it away or recycle it make something else out of it <laughs> awesome thanks very much john and yeah that's <laughs>